All right, welcome to this month's Gloucester Democratic City Committee Democratic Dialogue. I'm your host, Jeremy McKean, Ward 1 Chair, and I am uh, very excited and proud to be here with Eileen Duff. As a member of the Governor's Council, Eileen works to ensure civility and accountability of the judiciary and strives to make sure diversity and visibility from all aspects of society are representative. Eileen is firmly committed to civil rights and to the promotion of social justice. Eileen was the 2015 recipient of the Gloucester Bar Association Law Day Award given for her tremendous efforts to keep the Gloucester and community courts open. She also received the 2015 LGBTQ Bar Association's Elected Official of Distinction Award for her consistent efforts on educating and working with judges throughout the Commonwealth. And she frequently speaks to colleges, high schools, and the O'Malley Innovation School right here in Gloucester. Welcome. Thank you. I, I oh. had to mention O'Malley because I love those students. They, I can't, I went there to speak to them, and then they came into Boston, and um, had, we had a terrific visit with them. This yeah. was pre-COVID, but we'll do yeah. it again. Yeah, hearing that you met in Boston, it's strange because we're in the COVID times, right? And you know that would be delightful. So, uh, welcome. It's it's wonderful to have you here. You're a member of the Governor's Council. And just for our guest, um, let's start with that. The Massachusetts Governor's Council is, um, is something that you're elected to. And if you could just give us the rundown, why don't we know about it? And what should we know about it? Well, that's a great lead in Jeremy because I tell people it's the most important thing you probably haven't heard about. Um, attorneys know about it. Attorneys who are in court a lot know about it. Um, it is a uh, constitutional office, and there are eight counselors. We each represent one eighth of the state, so we each have five state Senate districts. So my district is bigger than a congressional district, and it goes all the way from Cape Ann to the New Hampshire border, and then all the way west to Pepperell. So it's, it's I mean, I can drive for two and a half hours and still be in my district. It's pretty wow. cool. Um, and, uh, the only way a tie can ever be broken is by the lieutenant governor who sits with us weekly. If the lieutenant governor isn't present, the governor sits with us. Um, but the lieutenant governor can only break a tie if the governor is in the building. And, and there's actually a process he has to do to come in, make this special speech, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, we would go to a, to a vote. So <laughs> If he's if he's in the building, you have someone page him, and he he runs in for the uh, for the vote. If it's a tie, yeah, and yeah. it has happened a few times. It, it's really? it, that, it, oh yeah, it's actually <laughs> it's very interesting because it it harkens back to our original constitution mm -hmm. and uh, verbiage and everything from then uh, of how it actually has to happen. And what's interesting is a few years ago, this was actually challenged in the state supreme court. And in uh, the the Constitution of the Commonwealth held strong and and won. Um, but anyway, uh, we meet every single week mm -hmm. um, on Wednesdays. It's actually determined in the Constitution when we meet. Uh, we are constitutionally mandated to meet Wednesday with the governor or lieutenant governor. And uh, there are two things that happen. There is. Um, an actual meeting with them where we, we take votes and it, it's a very formal process. But then we have hearings on judicial nominations, on clerk magistrates, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. And one of those, uh, the, the big news that um, has come out of that is, is the, elect, uh, the election of um, Justice Karen Budd, uh, Supreme Court um, Judiciary. <clears throat> what, um, what role did you have in that election? And uh, this is kind of an exciting time for the first woman, the first African-American in the position uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, tell us about that. It's very exciting. And um, she, she's actually not elected. She is selected by the governor through a very uh, detailed process. And then he gives his nomination to us. 
we have the the hearing which was actually streamed live on youtube and i i think it was taped and if it is i'm going to try to to get a, a link to it so people can actually see what happens and see the process um but we actually are the we can say yes or no to any of his uh, judicial nominations if we deny the nomination there is no recourse for the governor it, wow. it's dead it's it's not like he can override it or anything he could at a later date uh renominate them but mm. um you know i haven't seen that happen um justice bud is a tremendous tremendous person um mm -hmm. she went to peabody high school where i went to yeah. high school we uh -huh. weren't there at the same time i have to say she's a little younger um but she comes from a, a, a wonderful family and it, it's interesting because she is African-American and there weren't that many African-Americans in Peabody. So I'm sure her experience of high school was quite different than mine. Um, but I knew her family, I knew of her family. I didn't know them because her father was very friendly with my father um, through different political issues that were happening in the city at the time. So um, my dad's no longer alive, but. I speak to Kim's father on occasion, and uh, that would that was a really nice connection that we had. She is the well, it, she's the first. Um, I'm gonna say she's the first black chief justice, uh, a black woman chief justice. Yeah. But um, uh, Margaret Marshall in in Justice Bud actually said this in her speech. What a lot of people don't know, Margaret Marshall was the chief justice. She was South African. Oh. And, and so there's a little bit of a, yeah. am I really the first African-American or, or was she? Oh. Um, it, so it's, but for, for really, for the real, uh, what we're really trying to get to here in social justice is she is. Yeah. And uh, she's a, a wonderful uh, person in academic. Um, I brought her in Justice Lowy, who's also on the state Supreme Court as a justice, uh, to Peabody High School two years ago to speak to the students. And they were both impactful, but I have to say Justice Bud's impact on the students was profound, yeah. absolutely profound. Um, we, I actually received a letter yesterday live during, uh, right before the vote from a member of the school committee. And they asked me to read it aloud about what a difference um, her being there and speaking to young women, to speaking to young women and men of color about her journey and her success, what it has meant um, mm. to them. So it's, yeah, it's a it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a, an excellent accomplishment for um, for you. Uh, let's talk about you. What's What's been your journey? Uh, give us a little bit about your background. Um, okay. And and tell us about getting getting elected to the governor's council. And you know, I, I as long as I've been involved in Gloucester politics, which isn't that long, I've been uh, excited to share the room with you because you have okay. such a wonderful energy, <laughs> and I love it when you speak. And uh, I've been to you know several gatherings with different congressmen and senators, and you're there, and I'm proud that that I can share Gloucester and the Gloucester Democrats with you. But well, what about you, your journey? Tell us a little bit more okay. about um, and how you got to where you are. Um, well, and I'm gonna say one other thing about Justice Bud and then we can talk about me. Sure. Uh, there were, um, this was a, I knew her name was in the mix, but and I also knew some of the other names that were in the mix. And I will say, and I, I will take just a, teeny tiny bit of credit because I was told I was actually listened to. You know, you never know when you're lobbying so nice. <laughs> if they really pay attention or not. But I was yeah. told that I did have an impact on the governor. Um, I did have a talk with him about why I really strongly felt Kim Bud needed. I, I didn't really feel there was another option. Yeah. And um, it was a great conversation. I said a couple of things as I usually do when I talk to Governor Baker that he doesn't expect. But we had a really great conversation and I was thrilled, uh, you know, not only that he made the nomination, but I was told later by someone very close to him um, that it that it, he it did have some impact on it. So that's good. Excellent. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up, Jeremy, is because one of the things a governor's counselor has that I have used that other counselors don't use the same way is I have a lot of access to the governor and lieutenant governor. 
Um, there were only eight governor's counselors and he needs my vote. Mm. There are 140 reps or 160 reps and 40 senators. So there's more wiggle room with him in, in those groups. With us, there's not a lot of wiggle room. He, you're with him or you're not with him. And, and so if I call and say, I'd like to speak to him or I'd like to sit with him and have a meeting, I get the meeting. Mm. Um, and it's been um, a really interesting journey with this governor, the, the two of us in developing our relationship. Um, so I did just wanna say that. My background, um, mm -hmm. I, I tell people I come from a mixed marriage. My mother was a Republican who actually worked for Richard Nixon in Washington, D.C. when he was vice president. And my father was a member, member of the Massachusetts State Committee. Um, so he was a very active Democrat. Wow. And, uh, we had, we, I have to honestly say they never fought about politics at all, <laughs> but we had very rigorous conversations about politics and policy at the dinner table my entire life. And we were expected to be able to speak to the issues of the day. Uh, we were encouraged to write letters to elected officials if we didn't like what they were doing or if we liked what they were doing or if we had an idea um right. and and we did and you know i don't know what it's like now but people wrote back which was tremendous um yeah. and so my parents really raised us with an awareness that your vote counts your participation counts um you've got to make up your own mind but you have to participate you know if you're going to complain and you don't vote they don't want to hear about it yeah. um and, and so it was really, um, you know, it was just really part of our family culture. I also had um, an uncle in Chicago who was uh, the minority whip of the House of Representatives there. Mm -hmm. And I had an aunt in Alexandria who was um, on the city council in Alexandria and a huge environmentalist um, down in the DC area. And actually every year there's an award giving out in her name for the work that she did. She's the person that pioneered and literally testified before Congress um, to get the bike path built along the Potomac River. And wow. she used to, when we were kids, I spent a lot of time in Washington when I was a kid because my cousins, we were the same age. And so we'd go there for three weeks. They'd come here for three weeks. But Aunt Ellen would drag us down. <laughs> she, I can't tell you the protests I went to. Yeah. Um, and But she would also take us to the Library of Congress and we would do research. And yeah. She was, it was just a very active, it was, it was really just part of our life, honestly. Yeah. And I suppose to some people, it sounds a little weird, but it's just well, what we did. Yeah. Um, so I grew up campaigning as a young kid. My father was uh, on the city council. Uh, he ran for mayor at one point. He didn't win that race. Uh, he lost to Nick Maroulis, who later became our congressman, who I interned for in Washington. Wow. And, and um, one of my... Uh, points of pride is that the Marulis family are, are some of my biggest supporters today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our fathers were adversaries, you know, 50 years ago or whatever. And yeah. it's just, you know, it transcends a generation. Sure. I, I also think there was a respect in politics back then that we don't always see right now. Um, you may have been adversaries, but you were, you were active in the community because you were working for the greater good. Yeah. And, you know, you can't, you learn to compromise and you, and you learn to listen. Right. You have to work across the aisle. The, the sentiment that uh, president elect said about, you know, we're not enemies, right. you know, and, and there's so much animus today between the parties that um, sometimes it feels like we're enemies. And we have to remember right. that we can't be swayed by, you know, uh, certain voices that want to make that happen. Um, what, uh, Tell us a little bit about the role of, of uh, the governor's council, what you're doing each Wednesday. You have chambers yep. outside the governor's office. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Um, and a little, and then, you know, cause your background isn't, your, your background is not the same background as the other council members. Not which at gives all. A, a great insight. Tell us a little bit about that. So, so how I learned about the governor's council, honestly, was 
before my mother, you know, my mother's the daughter of an immigrant and her dad was old school and said, girls can be a secretary, a nurse or a housewife, mother. you know, yeah. whatever, a teacher. <laughs> my mother, so my mother went to secretarial school. When she graduated, she said, back in the day, you went to, you applied, you worked for a law firm and they just assigned you to a lawyer, to a new lawyer. Uh, there was no, the lawyers didn't hire you. You got to sign. The lawyer she got assigned to was a man named Chris Herter Jr., who ended up being a governor's counselor. Wow. Um, and his father was the governor of Massachusetts. And, the, and that's how she ended up, when Eisenhower was president, she ended up um, going to Washington in that, in the Eisenhower administration. She didn't start with Nixon. She ended up being assigned to his staff. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Jeremy. I have my mother has stories that you can't even believe. <laughs> Just yeah. amazing stories. Um, so I knew what the governor's council was. I also in high school did an internship one day a week on Wednesdays in Boston. I gave tours of the state house. It was under the secretary wow. of state's office, and we used to go to the governor's council meetings sometimes. So I actually was one of the only people That's that. Country. I just kind of knew what it was. Um, yeah. And I spent my career, as you said, um, my background is technology. I started in cable. Yeah. I worked in wireless. I ended up being appointed to a commissioner at the FCC in Washington. I was appointed by President Clinton to work for Commissioner Chong. And that was just a thrill of a lifetime because I was replacing an attorney. So my background was public policy. Um, but I'm not a lawyer. And, and so um, Commissioner Chong gave me the opportunity to really go to a whole other level. Um, she wanted, she specifically had asked for me, which I thought was fascinating because I'd only met her once. Mm -hmm. um, but she knew I'd lived in DC before. She knew I was in California at the time and that I was working on um, cell siting issues and issues in the wireless industry that were becoming really, really important. So mm -hmm. I was, I was kind of, um, in some ways, a safety player too. You know, she could put me in different places when she needed needed me. My main task, to be honest, was I was the gatekeeper to her. Nobody could see her unless they saw me first. Mm -hmm. So I met everybody. I met Barry Diller. I met um, uh, who's the guy with the mustache? CNN. I met them all. They all. Had to <laughs> Um, see me. In the in the joke in in at the FCC was, and I actually didn't even know what how crazy it was at the time. Was I was the only person that turned Steven Spielberg down for a meeting, <laughs> and people right. said, like, I said it just wasn't convenient for her, and <laughs> and my job was to protect her, right? I course, I kind of yeah. joke like my job was to take the bullets, right? And I have to say he capitulated and in met on our schedule, so um. I, I didn't realize it was kind of an outrageous thing to do. I was just doing my job. Yeah. But, but I guess the buzz went through the, the uh, building when they found that out. But anyway, uh -huh. um, so my background was public policy. I loved government. I went to college in DC. My intention, yeah. I'd always wanted to run for office. I was involved in yeah. high school, you know, just like so many people. But I followed my career and I lived in many places. I lived in California, I lived in DC, I lived in London. I actually lived in Vietnam for a little while. I mean, I was all over the place with my career. And finally I came home. And when I came back to Massachusetts well over 20 years ago, I decided I was gonna be, I went back to my roots of my parents saying, don't complain, be active. And so I got very active at the time with the local uh, Democratic City Committee, which was in Beverly, where I lived at the moment. And um, just, I knew about this office. I, I knew that um, the person who'd served before had started becoming very contentious with a lot of people. There were some mm -hmm. hearings that were not, is, is I hate, almost hate using the word civil, but there was a lot of unkindness that was happening. Mm -hmm. And it, it, a little bit of a preview of what we've experienced today. And I really strongly felt that I may not like you, but I need to respect you. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I've i stepped in it before. I've said some stupid things, and, but I will apologize if I do. And you can call me out on it because I should be held accountable. I'm an elected sure. official. Yeah. And I'm a public servant. That's the other part people seem to forget yeah. is we are elected to serve the public. 
So um, I take that very seriously. I think it's quite an honor uh, that people have entrusted this with me. And I've tried to use, like I said, my access to the governor and lieutenant governor a little bit differently to uh, help my communities, of, of which there are many, I have 38 cities and towns, to help them uh, lobby and access the governor, lieutenant governor, when they need to. So it might be a state rep or senator that, mm -hmm. that is, you know, needs another push on something. Um, I'm on the board of directors of the ARC of Greater Haverhill and Newburyport. They sometimes have legislation that they can't even get the governor to look at. I am, I am one of the few people that has the actual physical ability to put it on his desk. Wow. Probably not supposed to do that, but, <laughs> but I have. Um, yeah. And because our chamber is within his offices, so when we're meeting in person, right now with COVID, it's all different, but when we're meeting in person, I literally bump into the governor all the time. I mean, literally, like we're using the same restroom, we're using the same coffee machines where we're, he's right there all the time. Yeah. And um, I try not to waste his time, which I think he's he understands and he appreciates because a lot of people waste his time. And, you know, whether you agree with the guy or not on a lot of things, he's the CEO of a huge corporation, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and he doesn't have a lot of time to waste. Um, right. So I try to make it worth his while. And I also had to honestly uh, build a, a relationship with him because I am a very strong Democrat and, mm -hmm. and I um, am not afraid to take swings at people when I don't think they've done the right thing. And I've done that in the past with him and he's he's been a little taken back. You know, yeah. I'm only, I'm, I, I lie and say I'm five feet tall, but I'm 4'11 by the skin of my teeth and he's 6'6". So it's yeah. pretty hilarious to see the two of us together. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now, uh, uh, obviously Gloucester is your favorite city. It so. is my favorite city. <laughs> my move to Gloucester is the yeah. best thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, Without Mine too. Yeah. Best uh, move I've ever made. Now, uh, my old my old stomping ground, Salem, uh, and I work in Lynn, we have courthouses uh, yeah. and Gloucester has a courthouse. So tell us a little bit about your fight for community courthouses, <laughs> why that's so important, um, why that's so important to Gloucester and its citizens. It's huge and it's a big issue and it's gonna get bigger. And I actually talked to uh, Chief, new Chief Justice Butt about this and, and all the Supreme Court judges know how passionately I feel about this issue. Yeah. So until I moved to Gloucester, which was probably 12 or 15 years ago, I was under the impression it was a peninsula. Of course, when you get here, you realize it's an island. The and, island. And it's a big difference, right? There is a big difference. The next closest courthouse is 26 miles away in Salem. Yeah. We don't have, unfortunately at this time, a good, uh, reliable train or bus to get people up and back and forth. And part of my argument is you don't have any, you don't have justice for all or access to justice if people sure. literally cannot get to the courthouse, yeah. right? And so if you are the victim of, of a domestic assault or something and you've got to go to the court for a hearing are you supposed to get on the train with the perpetrator? Right. And in, in, in what if you have children? You've got to take those kids, pay tickets, get them on the train, get off the train in Salem, and then walk to the courthouse, which can be done. I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done, but sure. there are so many hindrances for people. Um, and it's it's not fair. It's not right. And, and we really need to address it. Um, the Salem Courthouse is a big, beautiful, uh, mega hub courthouse yeah. that was built with the intention, and I won't say it's wrong, it, it's just not, we're not there yet, of, of being what they call a hub court, so all the local communities will go to this one court, and it will be a centralized idea. It's not a bad concept, but without a way to get there, it, it just doesn't work. Right. And so when Governor Patrick was governor, I learned that the Gloucester Courthouse was slated to be closed. And I was I was stunned 
because, I, you know, I, I really feel this is my home. And I, I love my home and I love the people who live here. I, I feel a real great affinity for them. And so I asked um, to meet with the court administrator and the chief judges, not chief justices, but the judge, the chief of the trial court in the district court. There's all these different chiefs. And so we had this big powwow in Boston and they gave me all these spreadsheets and all these numbers. And they said, oh, counsel is nothing we can do about it. The numbers don't work you're losing money. They actually said to me, you're losing money. Yeah. And I, I looked at them and I said, but courts aren't in the business of making money. Right. We're in the business of administering justice. And I think they were kind of stunned by, by that statement. And so I took all their spreadsheets and I was nice and everything. And, and, I, and I said, you know, I have to tell you something. And I remember this, Jeremy, because I got very emotional and I, 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 it really caught me off guard, but my eyes really welled up. And I said, you know, you took our fisheries from us. You can't take our courthouse yeah. because we have businesses downtown that depend on that foot traffic to buy a sandwich, to, to, to buy a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, it's upstairs from the police station. We have a unique uh, relationship with our police in our court officers that not many people have anymore. And it really is part of the heart of our community. Um, and anyway, so we left the meeting and I looked at all the spreadsheets and I'm fortunate that um, I, I have a pretty good memory. And I remembered being told that um, the Gloucester court didn't pay any rent for the building, yet they had $50,000 a year on the spreadsheet. Oh. And so I, I went to different electeds and they told me there's nothing that can be done. There's nothing that can be done, Eileen. It's a done deal. <laughs> and I'll be really honest, Jeremy, I would not accept it. I called, um, he's now passed, Judge Harrison, and I talked to him about it. And he, I said, is it true? what I think. And he said, oh, it's absolutely true. And he said, give me a little bit of time, counselor, and I'll find you the lease. He found the lease. He sent it to me and I sent it to them. And then I went down and I sat with people who work in our courts locally, who are tremendous, wonderful people. And we went through the spreadsheet and they explained the numbers to me, you know, because frankly, it, it, I love numbers, right? I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to that, but you can make numbers do what you want them to do sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what they'd given me. The, the numbers weren't really reflective of what was happening in Gloucester. So I did my correction and I went back to them and I showed it to them and I showed it to Governor Patrick. And um, they were kind of like, well, you know, so I took my, so I took advantage of the fact that Lieutenant Governor under Patrick had, re, had left. So Governor right. Patrick literally sat with us every single week, every single week he was in the room for at least 15 minutes with me. Hmm. So every week for six months, I stood up and I made the exact same speech about the Gloucester Courthouse to the point where he finally came up to me one day and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, may I speak to you counselor about your courthouse? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, I get the message. Uh, and so that was how we saved it. Um, wonderful. You know, it was, but, but I really, I tell people, people as much as I really enjoyed governor Patrick, I did torture him. Yeah. I mean, I, it was like, it was like, I took his yeah, arm. Yeah. And his back. yeah that's excellent. <laughs> well, listen, we have to wind up. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. No, this, this is wonderful. Uh, tell us what's next for you. Um, anything we should be aware of? Well, right now I'm just trying to uh, do my job as governor's counselor, yeah. trying to get through COVID. We have one, we had a Supreme Court uh, nominee yesterday who was tremendous. Mm -hmm. I feel like Trump saying that. Um, we have another one coming up um, who is a uh, Haitian American judge, mm -hmm. uh, sits in the district court, in the drug court, which is very, very unusual to have someone like that elevated. And so it's an exciting time, but, but we can't, pat ourselves on the back too much because we've right. had we've had some diversity and equity we need to do better in the courts yeah. and that's what's next for me is holding uh the courts and the administration accountable to make sure that the judges are as diverse as our community because they right now they're not right and um 
and and we can do better and we will do better. So so right. I will be um, I think in the next few months setting out some benchmarks and and uh, drawing some lines in the sand to see uh, let's see who we really are and if we do it. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for thank being you. our guest. Uh, and uh, and this will be on GloucesterDemocrats.org. It'll be on Facebook too. Thank you again, Eileen Duff, Governor's Council, and I'm Jeremy McKean for uh, for Democratic Dialogue.